Welcome everyone to our Intro to Pressbooks webinar. I'm Leah DeForest, Communication Strategist with Texas Digital Library. Before we get started, I want to briefly orient you to the controls and blue jeans that you should see across the top of your screen. You can toggle off and on your webcam and microphone by using the first two buttons showing the camera and mic icons. Your microphone should be muted when you come into the meeting. We are asking that you keep your video off until the Q&A at the end and microphone muted as well. If you happen to have any audio issues using your computer audio or mic, you can switch to phone audio by clicking on the little down arrow next to the microphone icon. You will see a phone number to call as well as, as, well as a numeric code to enter. If you have questions or comments during the presentation today, you can use the chat window, which you'll see in the upper right corner of the screen. Just click on that to open up chat and enter your questions. We'll address all questions to presenters during the Q&A part of the webinar. If you want to ask a question at the Q&A, please type into the chat window, and I'll read questions for everyone on a first-come, first-served basis. And if you experience any tough technical difficulties during the presentation, let me know. I'm going to put my email address in chat so you can email me offline, and we'll try to deal with any issues you have. I'm excited to welcome everyone here again. Today, our guest speakers are Pressbooks EDU personnel, Elizabeth Mays, she is the Director of Sales and Marketing, and Steele Wagstaff, he's the Client Manager. Liz and Steele will discuss the benefits of a Pressbook membership, as well as demonstrate some of the platform's functionality. And now I'm going to hand things over to Liz and Steele. Thank you, Leah. Liz, I think you're muted still. Wonderful. I was just saying I'm going to hand things over to Steele and I'll be happy to answer any questions that come up for me later on. Thanks, Liz. Hey, I really appreciate being able to be here with you virtually today. I'm going to try to share my screen now and hopefully you'll tell me that I succeeded. Are you seeing my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. And how's my audio sound? Sounds good to me. If anyone in the audience is having trouble, type it in chat, but so far so good. Great, perfect. So um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about just the, the big overall picture. And um, this is this presentation, each of these slides or the, the, the PDF for them, I just posted them to Twitter just a few moments ago. So they're there at Steel Wagstaff, my Twitter account. If you'd like the slides or follow along, or if you want to reference them later, I just wanted to mention that at the onset so that you don't have to feel like, oh, I missed that link or that went too fast. That should be there for everyone. Um, and I think Liz probably just posted them in the chat too. So the first thing I wanted to say, just a little a bit of an introduction to who I am. So I'm Steel Wagstaff. I earned a library degree and a PhD in English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I worked for several years, more than 10 years. I taught English literature, I taught composition courses, and I was an administrator for the freshman writing program there. And then I transitioned from a kind of uh, academic teaching career into a academic staff role where I was doing educational technology consulting and supporting faculty in their teaching, doing faculty development. I worked in the College of Letters and Science, and while I was there, I started and ran a grassroots OAR publishing program. It, for me, was really fun. I loved doing it because it combined that love of technology with the love of uh, organization of information and then the love of books, which I had as a, as you can tell if you study English in library school, which I'm guessing many of you on the call did. That was a little bit of my background. And um, in the course of doing that, the tool that I, we adopted and that we were using quite heavily was Pressbooks. I started as an open source user. I became pretty involved in the Pressbooks open source community. I really came to appreciate and admire the people that were working on it and the project itself. And then in November of last year, uh, I joined Pressbooks full time as the educational client manager. And I also managed the product development a little bit as well. So that's a bit of my story and how I came to Pressbooks. Um, I still do live in Madison, work remotely on the team. But Pressbooks itself is headquartered in Montreal in Canada, though members of our team are distributed. Um, I want to start actually by talking a little bit about some of the animating principles. And this is one of my favorite slides. I'm not sure if she's on the call today, but this is this was built by a Texas librarian. Is Michelle Reed on the call? I have no idea. Um, Michelle Reed is an OER librarian at the University of Texas Arlington. And this is actually a wall hanging that she made. And she told me the last time I talked to her about it that it glows in the dark as well, which I love. But th this is like a slogan and it's a phrase that we often use 
at, in, in terms of giving people the quickest, fastest definition to open or open educational resources. The definition is open equals free plus permissions. And that means that open, when, if we wanted to, to know or understand whether content is truly open, we first have to ask ourselves, is it free? And does it grant other people certain permissions? And I wanna start with the permissions first. Usually when we talk about the permissions of OER, we're talking about these the five R's as David Wiley called them. And they are the permission to retain, to reuse, to revise, to remix and to redistribute. Each of these per permissions in an educational context are really, really powerful. It's what lets us do interesting things in terms of teaching and learning or in terms of distributing the kinds of innovations that we make. And it's important for us to think about this in the, in the context of open content or open publishing, and even maybe in the context of your own uh, professional values uh, as a librarian. Many of the things that matter for sharing information and making it making knowledge publicly available, have a connection in some way with some of these principles and these permissions. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is why this matters and why so many of us are concerned about textbooks in particular. And the first graph that I wanna show you here, this is the, the longest term view that we can see of what's called the Consumer Price Index for Educational Books and Supplies. So the federal government since 1967 has been tracking on an index the kind of average cost of educational books and supplies in the United States. And this is what that graph looks like over the last 50 something years. It's a terrifying graph. It's steady, regular growth. And it's growth that pretty fast outstrips the cost of inflation. So if you went to college in the 80s, your textbooks would have been, you know, one sixth, one seventh, maybe one tenth the cost that they are today. If you went to school maybe in this time frame, I'm not trying to date myself too much, but you can see that the index price of textbooks has more than doubled since the early 2000s. And that's, that's a cause for, of concern for lots of us, particularly when we think about trying to make educational opportunities affordable to all and making sure that we can distribute those more equi equitably. The next thing I wanna show you though is at the end of this curve, something weird is happening. So here, here's the next graph. And this is over just the last five years. This is since my son was born, I'm a father. Over the last five years, the, the graph starts to look a little bit different. This is also the graphs that is not just the time that my son was born, but this is when um, Cengage, one of the big educational publishers, emerged from bankruptcy with a slightly different business model. And I'll maybe hint at a couple of things that are connected to that in a second. And here's what this graph looks like over the last two and a half years. I'm gonna draw a little line here just to make this a little bit more obvious, but what you're seeing, if you, if you can't see the screen, what it's showing is that the index here at the starting point and at the ending point two and a half years later is more or less flat. This is unprecedented. If you were to recall back here, there, there was no period of even one year or two, year, or two years where that growth curve was flat. So over the last two and a half years, we've seen something happening with the price index. And for a lot of us that are working in open education, we're thinking, yeah, this is really exciting. This is great. We're finally doing something about the cost or the price. At least we're halting the, the steady growth of the price of educational materials. The thing that I want to suggest today is while that's true in part, it's a slightly more complicated story. And the story is this, that major educational publishers have more or less abandoned the traditional textbook. And we're now living in an era of courseware. Some of you may have courseware on your campus. Some of you may be excited about courseware. Some of you may be wondering, what is he talking about? What do we mean by courseware? So let me kind of share with you um, what Cengage is saying about what their business is. This was their annual report to shareholders. You may have seen the news that they are trying to merge with McGraw-Hill and make an even bigger super publisher, but here's what Cengage said in 2018. Growth in the market of digital solutions enables us to capture a greater share of the total market given the embedded and gradable accessible orientation of our digital products, as well as the lack of alternative substitutes. Higher education core digital gross sales have grown at 11% annually over the last three years. You'll notice that's a very different message than the, the graph we just saw for the price of textbooks. They're saying their, their digital gross sales have grown at a little over 11%. And they also say that our revenues are now predominantly derived from our courseware technology. Our sales, marketing, and services teams have shifted 
from a textbook to a software sales and support model. For those of us who are thinking about providing equitable access and educational opportunities, I, I want to suggest that for many of us, it's going to be a shift from thinking about textbooks and continuing to think about textbooks, but also starting to think about courseware and thinking about what these major publishers are talking about when they say courseware. And so the point that I want to make here is that to deliver OER, we have to think about content, which we have done a really good job of. And it's also time for us to think about platforms. And I want to unpack this a little bit before I get into the talk about Pressbooks specifically. So when we talk about content, I'm talking about the actual book, the activity, or the object that a learner uses. Here are some examples. If you've ever seen the Open Textbook Library, that's content. If you've ever seen Merlot, that huge repository in California, that's content. Anything on OER Commons, that's content. Anything in the LibreText Library, that's content. Any one of the OpenStax books that came out of Rice, that's content. Or even proprietary content, right? So content can be copyrighted, it can be permissibly licensed, or it could be in the public domain. What we're seeing in teaching and learning in higher ed is that openly licensed content is becoming increasingly common. That's the story of the textbook price flattening out. But in most cases, that content requires a platform. If you want to edit it, if you want to remix it, if you want to integrate it with the LMS, if you want to use any of those permissions that I was talking about that open licenses grant you, you need a platform. So then what's a platform? Well, a platform is basically where the content is authored, where it's edited, where it's assembled, and where it's distributed. So here are some examples. The, the evil ones first, you can boo and hiss if you want, but well, we've got MindTap, we've got Connect, we've got Rebel. We have Top Hat's textbook tool now. We also have a tool called Open Author. That's what OER Commons makes as their platform tool. Candela or Lumen Learning. Uh, Lumen makes a tool called Waymaker that's built on top of Pressbooks. Um, there's OpenStack CNX, which used to be the platform that, um, uh, what are they called? OpenStack textbooks were published in. It's since been retired. And Pressbooks, which is an example of a platform, and that's what I'll be mainly talking about today. Just as with content, platforms can be proprietary or platforms can be open source. A platform could be free or you have to pay money to use it for creators. So you might pay for an authoring license if you're using uh, an Adobe Captivate product, for example. It could be free or cost money to implement for instructors or institutions. And a platform can be free or cost money to access for learners. So if you think about the products that Pearson and Engage and others are selling, or Cengage are selling, what they're selling is access to the platform for learners. And so each of those, those points is a choice, and it could be otherwise. The thing that I want to emphasize is when I'm, we're talking about courseware, we're talking about the kinds of things we're thinking about making, it's a mixture of both content and platform, each of which can be licensed separately. Increasingly, content is OER, but most platforms today are still proprietary. And I hope you've get, I've given you a little bit of a sense for why we think this may be a problem. This is another quote from David Wiley, who in many ways is, many people consider one of the fathers of open education or open content. David, last year writing on his blog, said the battle to open source these platforms will be a very different battle than the battle over content licensing. Creating a courseware platform is still orders of magnitude more expensive and orders of magnitude more complex than creating an open textbook. So I don't want to make this all of your problem, but I do want to talk about some of the ways that we at Pressbooks are thinking about our platform, thinking about an open platform, and trying to make tools that allow people to, to fulfill a whole bunch of publishing needs, including open needs. So what is it that we want from our platforms? For me, I was trained as a librarian. I I, that, that code of ethics mattered a lot to me. It helped shape my thinking about the world and about the education that I wanted to participate in. And I want to start with a set of principles or a set of values that animate the work that I care about and I think the work of our organization and the company as of Pressbooks as a whole. And here are the platforms that I want to talk through. First, that it should be non-proprietary. Second, it should let users come and go freely. Third, it can be made personal or local. Fourth, does it play well with others? Fifth, does it help learners achieve their goals? Sixth, is it broadly inclusive and participatory? 
And seventh, is it skeptical of surveillance? Librarians in many ways are really at the lead for many of these things. So I'm hopeful that in some ways, the values and what we're talking about with our product here will resonate with the values that you hold and that you've devoted your professional lives and service to. First, is, is the platform or is the tool non-proprietary? Meaning, is it open source and does it use open source components? In our case, Pressbooks is an online book publishing platform. It makes it easy to generate clean, well-formatted books and multiple outputs. Pressbooks is built on top of WordPress and is itself open source. This is Hugh McGuire, our founder. Um, if you want, this is on the, the screenshot on the left here is pressbooks.org, which is the home of the Pressbooks open source project. We have a bunch of documentation and description for the open source part of Pressbooks. And a screenshot on the right is the readme at our GitHub repository. So the code that we produce and we release is released under open licenses. Anyone in the world can view it, can contribute to it, can comment on it, or can just download and run it themselves. Second, Pressbooks itself, when you install Pressbooks, it makes a bunch of really important transformations to WordPress. And so each Pressbooks instance is its own network. And so what you're seeing on this page is an example of four different Pressbooks networks. Here's one that's being run by uh, eCampus Ontario, which is a large provincial organization in Canada. Here's one that's being run by the Open Textbook Network, which many of your schools may belong to. Here's one on the bottom left from Texas. The University of Houston has their own Pressbooks instance. This is their own network. And here's one from the Rebus community. So each Pressbooks installation is its own network. On that network, you can have a big sortable catalog of all of the public books on a given network. That catalog can be filtered by subject, by license, be sorted, and you can see here are an example of a bunch of public books that have been published on a given network. Second, thinking about what do people do with Pressbooks. There's a lot of things that people use Pressbooks for, but helping you think about use cases. I'm not going to provide um, lots of detailed examples for every one of these things, but I could outside this call or we could do that in a follow-up thing, but usually people are using Pressbooks to replace expensive textbooks. A lot of times people are saying we want to publish or adopt or adapt a free textbook or an openly licensed textbook for a higher enrollment course and bring the cost down for learners. Second, we might want to remix or make a local edition and edit some existing OER. We found this OpenStax book, we really like it, or we found a book that some other, somebody else has published at some other school and it has an open license, we want to modify it for our context or for our learners, maybe make it more culturally relevant for, the, for students of a different background that, that we happen to have at our institution. The other kind of thing people might build would be manuals, guides, handbooks, those kinds of um, gray matter publishing material that departments and institutions often want to make, or even course teasers where you're teaching a full course behind the LMS but you want to make one unit or one chapter or something available on the web so that prospective students could see, oh, here's a taste of what I might learn or what I might see in the class. Um, we see that being increasingly done by like distance education or extension programs. The other thing that people are doing quite often with Pressbooks are making anthologies of work that's either Creative Commons licensed or in the public domain. In fields like mine, like English or like history or like even political science, a lot of material in the field, the primary texts were published before 1923. If that's the case, there's no need necessarily to buy a Norton anthology of early American literature when you could just make one of material in the public domain. So there's a lot of cool projects like that that are happening. It's also a nice venue to collect and distribute government documents or other public and open and licensed material. And then the last category is a category that feels really close to my heart. These would be either the community authored or the student authored projects. So we've seen a lot of professors practicing open pedagogy and, and forming partnerships with sometimes cultural organizations, the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums to present material from their collections. Sometimes they're doing something called renewable assignments where students are building a resource that has a public use that, that lives outside of the class. Object studies where they're writing about collections in, in museums and things like that. Or even field work and they're writing up the result of the field work to be reused in the future. And then Pressbooks is also a nice tool to be used for student writing, for award-winning assignments, for class projects, and for e-portfolios so that students have a place where their work lives after they've finished enrolling. Um, the other kind of thing that you'll want to see is that in addition to being a large network, each press book or each book on the network 
has a unique web address. It lives at its own location, it has its own URL. And here on the right hand side is what a sample book, press book in a book, a web book in press books looks like. You'll see there's a title and author information, a brief description. We're seeing some licensing information, and I'll get talk to that a little bit more later. And then you're seeing here's a cover image. They they created a cover for this book and uploaded it. And they chose to make downloads of this book available in many different formats from the book's homepage. Down below is a table of contents. Clicking on any one of these would let you jump into that part of the book and start reading. And down below, I'm sorry I didn't show it to a group of librarians, but there's a lot more book information or metadata that we allow people to enter and display to help them understand what this book is and different features of it. Okay, this is the editing interface. So the editing interface, if you've used a word processor, if you've used WordPress before, will look pretty familiar. It's a kind of what we call a what you see is what you get or a WYSIWYG editor. And you can see that it's fairly simple um, to train and to teach faculty, even ones that are a bit tech averse. If they've used a word processor, we can usually train them to use the authoring interface pretty quickly. Another thing to note about Pressbooks is that because it's done on the web, we keep revision history so you could revert to previous revisions. And you can have multiple collaborators working on the same book at the same time with different roles. So I could be a book administrator and I could invite two of you to be editors in the book, invite three of your colleagues to be authors, and then to have a few students just serve as contributors. And all of us could be working in the same book at the same time, though with different roles. Um, and that's a nice feature because it's web-based. The other thing that we make possible is book organization tools. I'm not sure how visible this is to everybody, so I'll kind of, it's a little bit grainy if you can't see it very clearly, but what this is is like a table of contents for your book. It's a drag and drop chapter organization interface, so there's some front matter here. This is a part or a section. Each one of these are individual chapters, and here's another part or a section. If I wanted to take this chapter, I could click and drag it up to here, reorder it, I could drag it down to another part and move it down there. And it's a nice, pretty simple and easy to use interface that lets you arrange and organize your book. You can also select whether any particular part of the book is visible in, on the web or private to the web. You could password protect it. Um, or you can choose whether to make it visible or not included in your various exports. So what you can do is have one huge book and make many different kind of sections or exports from that book with this interface here that's pretty easy to use. The second principle for us that's a, a principle of importance is, does the tool let users come and go freely? We want, in my view, we want to avoid vendor lock-in by allowing easy import and export of our content. If you use our tool, you should use it because it's a good tool and because it serves your needs, not because you've you're contractually obligated and everything you made in that tool can't be used anywhere else. That's, I think, bad form and bad practice. I think many of you probably agree as evidenced by the battles people have been having with <laughs> some of the other big publishers over some of the big deals and things like that, right? So to import content, we support, um, if you find open and licensed content that isn't already in Pressbooks, we support importing from several different file formats. You can import from another Pressbook or from WordPress. You can import from EPUBs from Word documents or open documents. And you also, we have a limited support for Im importing directly from HTML files. And um, we make it, we try to make it very easy for you to get content in and then edit it once it's in Pressbooks. We also want to support you in exporting your content and doing what you want with it. Um, we support one click creation of more than a dozen different formats, including eBooks, Mobi files, PDF for digital distribution, print ready PDFs, and several XML and more exotic flavors. Um, um, that's something that uh, you do with one click and you can save and display your old exports. You can also make them available for download if the book is open and you'd like to do that. Or you can take those files if it's an all rights reserved book and choose to sell them through the distributor of your choice. Um, that's also available to you as a publisher. Um, I also want to show when you're making your print-ready PDF, we have a nice interface with a ton of different options and choices that help you get your book with a pretty simple set of interface choices or complicated if you want them to be. Um, this allows you to really customize the size, the style, the margins, and a bunch of printer-type things so that the 
the print ready PDFs look the way you want them to look without you having to know a bunch of coding yourself. So there's a set, set of PDF export options that are pretty nice and easy to customize. The second, the third principle is, um, does the platform let you make the content personal and local? If we're talking about open content and we're talking about permissions, does the tool support those permissions? Does it let you edit and remix and redistribute? Um, and so the question is, can you clone, revise, and remix? And for us, the answer is yes. First of all, we want to support all authors in choosing the appropriate license for their work. Many authors will want to say this, oops, sorry. Many authors will want to say this should be all rights reserved, but many authors will also say, I'd like to license this, especially because it's being used for educational purposes under a more generous license. And so you can see at the book level, I can indicate the copyright holder and what license I've chosen to, to license my work as well as indicating that it's in the public domain. And we also have a similar kind of interface at the chapter level. So if you're working on an edited collection, the book could have one license and individual chapters could have uh, individual licenses depending on the contributor's preferences. You'll also see here that we have support for DOIs. So if you're minting DOIs or ISBNs for your book, those can be integrated at the book or the chapter level. The second thing that we've done is we built an API for books and this allows you what it basically does is it lets you say, I found a public openly licensed book on any other Pressbooks network. Let's say you found something on the University of Houston's network or at the Open Textbook Network and you want to make a local copy. You enter the URL, you tell it where you want to live on your network, and you click clone. And we will make a cloned, fully functional copy of that original book. Because uh, using these permissions is important. It's also important to respect the terms of the license. And so when we clone a book, there will automatically be an attribution included that says this book here that you're looking at is a clone version of the parent book and give you a link to the source so that you can respect the CCBY or the attribution license that you're uh, copying the book under. Another thing that we'll make available is if you want to show it, you can also display underneath each chapter a kind of side-by-side -side comparison that shows you the live version of the original text. Oops, I'm pressing my buttons. A live version of the original text on the left and the live version of your clone text so that if you wanted to make it available, a learner or someone else could compare and see what changes you had made and what they looked like from the original. The fourth principle is, does the tool play well with others? Do we use broadly accepted standards? I will say this was one of the most important things that I learned in library school that mattered, that's gonna be like a life lesson to me. It's like understanding standards and using them well is something that many tech companies don't get and don't do well, but it is really important and it's an important value for us. So here's acronym SOUP. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all these standards, but what I wanna show is that, that we, we care about web standards, we care about other kind of export and book standards, we care about accessibility standards. We've published a VPAT. We've sought to make sure that all of our interface is compliant with WCAG 2.0 A and AA standards. We also support a series of IMS global standards, including LTI and thin common cartridge. We support SSO, and I'll show you that in a second, single sign-on. And we're also exploring MARC record exports and some other IMS global standards that we think are important to our learners or our users. Um, this is what an LTI integration might look like. So. This is uh, the, the LMS that you're seeing here is Canvas. I've taken a single Pressbooks title and made one export. And when I imported it into Canvas, it brought in every one of my chapters as an LTI link. This means that when a learner clicks on the link, they'll see the Pressbooks content inside of the LMS as though it were native to the LMS. So the learner has a lower cognitive load. They're seeing the book as if it were part of Canvas, but they're seeing the book with all of its Pressbooks features right there. If they wanted to, the instructor could also then put a quiz or a discussion forum or any other LMS activity in between chapters. The book is just acting as a spine here, and it's also keeping them in one place if that's where the learning is supposed to happen in that instance. So that's kind of what we do with that particular standard. We also support single sign-on. So on certain networks, if you want, this is something where you can set up either with CAS, if that's the authentication method that you use, or SAML2, sometimes uh, people refer to it as Shibboleth. So here's an example of a login page for a network that has uh, SSO. 
In this network, users could log in just with their username and, and password, or they could log in with their, they call it Hawk ID at, in, at Iowa. So if a user clicks this button, it takes them to their NetID field and they enter their NetID password, and then we check it against uh, the Pressbooks record and we grant them access to Pressbooks because they've integrated with their system. Um, the, the fifth principle here is, does the platform help learners achieve their goals? And by this we mean, does the book or does the publishing platform allow you to include interactive components? And if it does, it, are they components where the feedback is designed for learners first? Not necessarily for administrators, even for teachers, but is the feedback built for learners? And this is something that we've really worked hard to try to do. So we let people in, embed lots of different kinds of interactive elements. So for example, you can add YouTube or Vimeo videos. You can add FET simulations. Here's an example here, a kind of gene uh, expression activity that was built at Colorado. We grab the URL, we paste it into its own line in Pressbooks, and voila, the activity is, sorry, it's just natively embedded there in Pressbooks. There's a number of different types of embeddable content that we support by just pasting the URL into the editor. The other kinds of things that we would support would be embedding interactive content, like audio, video materials. Here's a YouTube video. Here's an audio playlist with a series of uh, vocabulary words that you could play and listen to in a Portuguese language book. And here's an example of just an audio file on its own in a press book. All of those things are things that you can't do very well with print, but you can do with web books, and we also want to support in press books. The other really exciting piece is that we've integrated um, a third-party plugin called H5P. H5P networks, or H5P allows you to build a whole bunch of different interactive activities directly in the Pressbooks dashboard. So here, this example, you're seeing someone building a multiple choice quiz. They've made this quiz and this activity, and there are something like 40 different interactive content types available from H5P. They're really exciting. There's tons and tons of them. I could talk a little bit more, maybe even demo this at the end if, if you wanted to see more, this in more detail. But you can make any one of these activities directly in Pressbooks and then embed it in a Pressbook. So here's two examples that I really love. This is a friend of mine in Indiana. She, she, took a screen, uh, she took a photograph of her desk as a woman working in tech, and then she annotated this image using what's called, what are called hotspots. So this is embedded in a Pressbook. She says professional life. And then there's this interactive activity where you can learn more about her through an annotated image. And then she writes below it what she's describing and telling more about the activity. On the right-hand side, here's an example of a flashcard quiz activity. My friend and colleague Naomi Salmon built this at Wisconsin. She's teaching people the, the flora and fauna of Wisconsin. So here you see a picture of the snail and you type in what you think the name of the snail is and you check your answer. It will give you immediate real-time feedback saying, oh no, that wasn't it. If you wanted to, you could also click this little I button and get a hint or get some kind of clue. And so there's a six part flashcard activity she built to teach people some of the animals and plants of the state. You can build these types of activities and lots, lots more into your books, which is really exciting, I think, for lots of our educators. The other thing that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that if we're making an export that doesn't include interaction, like a print PDF, that we have a graceful fallback. So here we had a YouTube video and in the PDF it will say there was a YouTube element. It's been excluded from this version of the text. If you want, you can visit this URL to see the video. So we're, we're making sure that even in the formats that can include interaction, the learner knows that something was there and where they could find it. Here's a fun story, I'm kind of putting it all together. This was the very first project that I ever published in Pressbooks. So it's kind of my Pressbooks origin story. This book here, uh, this kind of green dragon here, was published in 1964. Uh, it was a Brazilian Portuguese textbook. It was revised several times, but the last revision they made was in 1993 by Severino Albuquerque and Mary Schill. The problem that we had was we, we couldn't make new revisions of this book because all we had were scans of the book made by our library. And so they needed to make updates to the book. There were a lot of reasons why this book was out of date. One of them, for example, was they had asked them about future tense verbs. And they'd say, what will you be doing in 1999? That's printed in the text, right? That's no longer a future tense question. That's 20 years old, right? So they needed to update the book. So what we did was we took that scan, we OCR'd it, we brought it into Google Docs, we cleaned it all up, and then we brought it into Pressbooks. And we published it now as this freely available open online text. 
it's the first digital edition, it now has 30 audio dialogues where you can press play and listen to native speakers have a conversation. We have over a thousand audio vocabulary words where listeners can, in the book, you can listen to someone say each of the vocabulary words as a native speaker. And then they built over 120 of those interactive H5P activities. They have fill in the blank activities. They have verb conjugation practices. They have uh, drag and drop activities. They have all kinds of activities where learners can test their knowledge and, and figure out how well am I doing with the content that I've just read. In the textbook, they would write questions and say, okay, write this out as a worksheet, give it to your professor and they'll give you feedback. But now they can just do that directly in the book and they're freeing up more class time for active learning and direct instruction. Um, the, the next principle here is that is, is the platform inclusive? Is it participatory? By this, it can mean many different things, but I'm gonna to choose to focus on a kind of narrow set, which is, does the tool invite and enable both public and private web annotation? Does it let people write in the margins or on the text or include that content? So just as with H5P, we've also integrated with another third-party tool called Hypothesis. Hypothesis lets people do open annotation, web annotation, on a Pressbook text. This annotation could be in a public layer, it could be in a publisher layer, or it could be in a private group that is visible only to students in a particular class. It can also be used for private note taking and marginalia. All the kinds of things you used to be able to do in the margins of your book, you can do in a press book. And you can do this, actually, you can do some things that you couldn't do just in the margins of your book. So the big idea here is that because it's on the web, it can include more than just text on text. Here's an example of a poem. So I love the poet Lorraine Niedecker. She's from Wisconsin. Um, here's a short poem that I teach people about. And in the annotation pane, you can see in the annotation layer, I've included a photograph of a historical marker in this place, Pawpaw, that she writes about. I've included a YouTube video about Pawpaw as a fruit, how you can cut and serve it. I've got a link to a bunch of recipes for cooking with Pawpaw. And then down here, there's an audio file that has the poet herself reading a poem so you can hear her voice as a living person, right? Um, all of these things can happen in the annotation layer just like they can happen in the book itself. And that's a really exciting possibility because I can do teaching and learning things here that are public. I could also do them just in my class. I could have students go out and reply to each other in their textbook instead of having to do it in a discussion forum. If that's exciting to you and you wanna see more ideas for that, I gave a presentation during Open Ed Week with Jeremy Dean, who's the Director of Education for Hypothesis, and you're welcome to dig into that a bit more or ask questions about it later. Um, the last principle is, should we, are we skeptical of surveillance? I think one of the big things that's gonna happen and we'll likely be dealing with in the next several years are gonna be fallout and concerns over um, surveillance and use of student data and appropriate use of student data. So does the platform only permit ethical, learner-centered analytics and reporting. Right now, we're really pleased to report that we do not track or store any information about what learners are doing in our books. Um, we have an EDU privacy policy where we make it clear what we do and what we don't and why. We have started to talk with our existing clients and others in this community about what ethical learner-centered analytics might look like. And two things that we're considering, which we haven't yet built, but we're thinking about, one would be Many people that are using the LTI tool would like to do some outcomes reporting. Um, I worked on an experimental project at Wisconsin where we did this, and so that's something that we'd be considering and looking at doing with great pass back. And then the second thing would be um, instrumenting Pressbooks so that it produces learning analytic statements, but probably rather than us storing them and then selling them back to you, my preference or our preference would be to send them directly to an institution owned or institution run learning record store so that you could care for your learner data since it's their data um, you ought to be the stewards and the caretakers of it rather than some ed tech company who has uh, different motives than your own so this is a, a little bit of our thoughts on this value or this principle so the, the next step is like okay so that's what Pressbooks is and more or less what it does and why we care about it so what are your options um, for using Pressbooks so we, uh, you can, of course, install, download the software and install it yourself on your own server. Um, I did that for a few years and I had a good time except for 
that it was very hard and time consuming and I wanted to do other things than run, uh, be a DevOps system administrator. So we have hosted plans where um, we will host and maintain and update Pressbooks EDU networks for schools. You can contact Liz or sales at Pressbooks directly or visit this URL on our website to learn more about those hosted offerings. You can also follow what we're up to on our blog on our website. Um, one of those blog posts is an our announcement of a partnership with TDL that includes 30% off of the hosted Pressbooks network. Um, we have a really detailed user guide that's kind of a self-paced documentation. We have a whole ton of training videos that show people how to do things. And then links to an open, our open source project and uh, the community forum and our GitHub repository. So that's a lot of different ways that people can find out a little bit more about Pressbooks and see what we are and how we do things uh, as openly or as transparently as possible. Um, so that is what I wanted to kind of present. I know uh, we've got maybe 15 minutes for questions and for live demo. I'm more than happy to, I'll go in and check out chat right now and see what you want to know more about or what you'd like to ask me or Liz. Shop, stop sharing for a second and look at the chat. Oh, okay. It was mainly just Liz in the chat. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> this is Leah um, Steele. I'm wondering if, okay, we do have a question, a couple questions coming in, so I'll save mine. <laughs> we have a question from Kelly. Could you explain more about the non-hosted version? Sure. So, so as I said, Pressbooks is, is open source software. So what you would do is if you controlled or owned your own server, you could download the, we have installation instructions on the Pressbooks.org site, but you'd have to install your own Pressbooks network and then you would be running it on whatever hosting or whatever server you were doing and you would be using the open source version of Pressbooks. If you do it yourself, there's a couple things you need to know about. You need to know that um, you're going to be responsible for all of your security patches, all of the updates. We release re releases pretty regularly, and so you'd be responsible for keeping that up to date and all of the various um, dependencies and those kinds of things. Um, it's, you're going to need probably someone who's a pretty experienced DevOps person or system administrator. And if I'm being honest, those people generally are pretty expensive. They're usually much more expensive than our hosted plan is or are. That's what we found at least. I was doing a lot of this myself and involving asking for other people's help and it became so costly that it was more cost effective for us to go to Pressbooks hosting. But that is how you would do that non-hosted version. I hope that spoke to your question, Kelly, but if not, I can clarify more. Hmm. Okay, so Blackboard integration, both Angela and Arlene are asking about that. Yeah, so the, I was showing an example in Canvas, but the principle is the same for any LMS. The integration that we built, that LTI integration, the idea of LTI is that it's interoperable with any learning management system. I just happened to use Canvas in my screenshots because that was the one that I had access to at Wisconsin when I was making the screenshots. But at Wisconsin, we started with Desire to Learn and Moodle and then moved to Canvas. So there was a time that we were using three LMSs and I was actually using the Pressbooks LTI integration with all three and it worked fine. We also have, uh, we know of a number of users, both open source and hosted clients that use it with Blackboard. So the LTI principle is the same. Yeah. You're welcome. Do I have any other example? Um, uh, Arlene, could you clarify that question a little bit? Oh yes, other examples of press, yeah, because I didn't show a lot of actual examples. Sure, um, I could show you examples in, I could show you dozens of examples if you have a, maybe a discipline or some kind of uh, topic in mind and I could, accounting, <laughs> great question. Um, yes, I could show something that's maybe accounting adjacent, but I'll, maybe I'll, um, while I'm thinking of that, uh, Liz, Raymond has a question for us about, how many universities and colleges have adopted Pressbooks? I think you might have more accurate numbers than I do on that. Yeah, sure, I, I see that question. Um, I would say probably including those who are utilizing it through different consortiums, um, I would say probably 75 to 100 right about now. And it kind of depends, like some of those might be doing, you know, less, 
utilizing it yes, less than others um, through sort of limited arrangements. Others might have their own system where they're doing hundreds of books. So it kind of runs the gamut, but that's a good ballpark. Uh, let me, I'm trying to think of, I, I can't, I don't know if I have a good accounting example for you right now, Arlene, but I'll show you um, if I can remember the URL. Um, how about a, one that's math heavy, at least, or business management? Okay, um, sure. Uh, I will, let me jump into a screen share and then uh, if I can remember how to do that again. I'll show you an example of a book. Here we go. Okay, so here's a book that I worked on at Wisconsin. It was for, uh, there was the, the, the honors biology program had made a series of manuals for their students. And so they, they have a statistics primer that they made available for learners. And so here's, uh, this was kind of a math heavy book. So the professor starts by saying, okay, we're thinking about data. Here's some variability. I don't know where he gets into his math stuff. Okay, so they have an example of like, Popularization generalizations, they've got some tables. I know they use LaTeX and math stuff quite a lot in this book. I'm probably scrolling too quickly to, for it to be useful. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could see here's the annotation layer that you could expand and move around and you could have public annotations. So like, let's say a student has questions about accurate, accuracy and precision. If I wanted to, as a professor, I could be like, oh, Here's the part of the book that you need to be paying attention to. So I'd write, sorry, I'd write in here. Um, to understand this better, see, and then I paste a YouTube video or something like that. If I wanted to, I could make that public annotation, and then I could actually just share a link to that annotation with the student. And then when the student would grab that annotation, they would jump to that particular part of the book and they would see my comment for them, which is a kind of nice feature. Um, Arlene, is this okay for as an example? Um, and you'll see like there's there's an example here. There's probably some good data in here somewhere. You can see math and all that other kinds of stuff. Another fun book that um, is a topic that went a little bit over my head was, was like game theory. Yeah. Um, there's two Spanish brothers and an econ professor. They wrote this really cool textbook that I really loved called Agent-Based Evolutionary Game Dynamics. And they're like, they're teaching you how to use this net logo software and to run like simulations and all those kinds of things. You'll see there's a bunch of features like footnotes and other kinds of things that are pretty common for books. As you roll over it, there's a tool tip. If I were to click on it, I would jump down to the footnote and I'd jump back up to the footnote. You see section headings and subject titles, you block quotes, all the kinds of things that you'd see normally from an ordinary textbook except that in this book you'll have interactive videos and other stuff that's, again, I haven't studied this topic, but I guess I should start with the open textbook <laughs> um, and learn more about it. Um, those are a couple examples that come to mind just offhand. I'd be happy to provide other ones, um, or we could email about them. I, uh, I, we don't, I don't know all of the books that have been created with Pressbooks, because as Liz said, there's probably close to 100 schools using it and, and making new books all the time. So. I can't quite keep up, but I often go to the open textbook library and just see, oh, here's a new cool book. That's interesting. Um, and then James asked about, oh, sorry, Kelly said, oh, let's get to Kelly's question. Kelly actually, asked, can you me, give a, go ahead, Liz. I, actually, let me get Colleen's because hers was first. Oh, okay. Um, sorry what was Colleen's that. question? Um, and and oh. we were supposed to read them out for the transcript. Yeah, so Colleen says, so plans aren't based on number of books created or edited correct. Looks like it's based more on storage size, users, and views. Um, so I can speak to that. We basically have two plans for individual institutions. We have the silver plan and we have the gold plan. And what the silver plan is, is it is essentially an enterprise system for your institution that is brandable to your institution. You can change the logo, the colors, the title, all of these different things. You have an institutional catalog that comes with it for the, the work that you create. And then that comes with various educational features. So everything from the cloning tool that Steele demonstrated uh, to H5P integration, uh, Google Analytics integration, uh, on the on all of our institutional plans, we have thin common cartridge exports with web links. 
we also have on top of all of that software, we also have a layer of support and training. Um, so typically each plan has a number of support contacts, either three or five, uh, who are sort of the point people to us to escalate any bugs or complex support issues. And uh, they receive a training, but in addition to that training, we also will do a training or several trainings, depending on your plan, for the actual faculty uh, in how to use Pressbooks for their OER efforts. And then we provide support to those, um, what we call network managers, who are, again, the support contacts. Um, that, that is all in the silver plan. The gold plan, the major differentiator there, yes, there are some differences in the storage and, and things like that, but the biggest nuance is really that that has the availability of integrations with your university infrastructure. So yeah. particularly um, included in that plan is an LTI integration, and that is the one um, that's still described with Blackboard or Canvas or, or Moodle or D2L, et cetera. Uh, also on that plan, you can, for an additional one-time configuration fee, you can get SSO uh, working and authenticating and integrated with your university there as well. So those are the bigger differences between the plans. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, so I would say to your question, Colleen, speaking of that, yeah, it's, it's um, we don't, we, my view is we don't really want to meter your plan based on the number of books because the point is to make as many, like the, if the point is to encourage open content, we, we don't want to, dis, we want to incentivize you to use it as much as you, as, as much as is useful for you. Um, we, I think we all benefit, the, the more people make open content or the more they publish useful learning material, the more everyone benefits. So our, our business model ought to reflect that in my view, and so that's why we try to do that. Um, Kelly, Kelly asks us, can you give a very, very general explanation of how campuses are starting this process? Meaning, is one librarian in charge and educating professors? Is a team in charge of it? Advertising, educating, et cetera. What experiences have you had and or seen in this aspect? That's a great question. <laughs> Liz, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, no, and I'll, I'll say we've actually talked with some of the schools that are using Pressbooks, and on our blog, you'll actually find some case studies. Um, it's been a few months since we've done one, but we've done maybe eight or ten case studies talking about each, each school's unique way of implementing it. But in general, um, many of those we're talking with are uh, groups made up of, you know, a librarian, the OER initiative coordinator, um, sometimes the Center for Tr uh, Teaching and Learning. Um, so they're typically, you know, cross university groups who've been uh, put together for the purpose of advancing OER initiatives or projects that you may have in place. Um, and I've seen people use different ways to market their initiatives to the faculty. Sometimes there's grants attached to it. Sometimes there are communities of practice around it. Um, and I suppose I would actually say those case studies kind of go in more detail with individual schools. Steele, do you want to add anything to? No, I mean, that's, so, there are lots and lots of different models for this. In, in many cases, the creation of OER and the open stuff is very grassroots. It's usually, it's like a couple of passionate people who believe, like they're like, we think education matters, we think it should be more affordable, and I'll be honest, it's often librarians, the people whose professional values align with those ideas. Um, and so those people will say, we are the champions and we want to do this and we want to grow a program or or, or do something well. And then they're thinking, well, what are the appropriate tools for us? And that's a hard thing to do. So sometimes they'll say, like, well, we want somebody from IT or we want an ed tech consultant or somebody to help us assess the tool space. And so that's usually where people start to look at Pressbooks and say, what are our options? How do we want to do this? Um, and then um, once it becomes an adopted tool, there's lots of different models for how that works as well. So in some cases, the institution will offer some kind of grant program or incentives for instructors to either write a new text or adopt an existing text. Sometimes they offer like course releases or small grant programs. Um, there's a, a big community, and I think there's probably a bunch of resources that we could share with you outside of our Pressbook stuff where people are talking about these questions. There's a bunch of email listservs that librarians are on. Spark has been very active in that respect, and the Open Textbook Network has been very active in that respect. Um, and then I would also say that there's a bunch of other kinds of uses for Pressbooks. I really focused on the open thing because 
I was thinking that would be what resonates with this audience. But there are a lot of people that use Pressbooks for self-publishing or for publishing um, print material. There's some small presses that just make all their print books with Pressbooks and sell them. Um, there are people that, that do distance education or like online courses and that kind of course development with Pressbooks. And so depending on the needs of your campus and what you want to use Pressbooks for, it's pretty versatile and it can be shared across many people. Um, the support, the, the way the support looks is, as Liz was saying, if you host with us, we'll have you designate usually between three to five people that serve as network managers. And the network manager is somebody who would um, be able to configure what your homepage looks like for Pressbooks, administer books, add new users to the network, that kind of thing if needed. And then there are also people that we provide extra support for. So at lots of schools, the network manager is a librarian or it's sometimes like a technology consultants. Occasionally it's a, a really motivated faculty person. They're not always technical people. Uh, they're not like your LMS, LMS administrator necessarily. Um, and so that's um, when people host with us, what, the, what you're paying for is not the software because the software is openly licensed. What you're paying for is the hosting, the security, and the set of training and other services and the, I, what we think is excellent support. Um, so kind of like if you were to host, like if you were to use Moodle as you open LMS or something like that. Um, Liz posted some links to the VPAT and accessibility policy. Um, there's also a couple of guides in addition to what Liz just shared there in relation to our the accessibility of our authoring tool. There are a number of guides that people in our community and that we have pointed to that help people understand how they can use this tool to make sure the content they publish is accessible. Because the tool, the authoring interface can be accessible, but you can make inaccessible content if you don't, for example, like add alt tags to images or make other kinds of decisions. So Liz just posted a link there to a really nice toolkit that our friends at, B, in, at BC Campus made about making accessible content, and they're very heavy Pressbooks users, so you can see there's a lot of Pressbooks type examples and things there in that toolkit. I think we're running right up on time. Um, Leah, do you yeah. want us to, to do anything else before we close down? Oh, could you sing us a song? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I am so pleased with all of these questions, and I think we're, you know, this is just the beginning. So um, I, I'm good. Uh, I hope everyone in the audience is good. It's just about to roll over to three o'clock here in Austin. We want to thank, we at, at, at TDL want to thank everyone for joining us today and especially to Steele and Liz and to Pressbooks who is also a sponsor of this year's Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. For those of you who are still on, just so you know, we will be captioning this recording and it will be ready to send out with some links to the slides and also the other um, resources that have been linked in chat. Uh, we'll be sending that out in the next couple of weeks, probably after our conference. So stay tuned and all these materials will be ready for you. I think yeah. that's all. Um, this is excellent. And also just in, uh, to mention, we are hoping to have a repeat of this webinar that will be geared towards faculty in the fall. That date is to be determined. Um, so as you're thinking about everything that Liz and Steele have presented, be thinking about the kind of faculty you might want to invite to our fall webinar. Anything else, Steele and Liz? This was wonderful. No, I just really appreciate it. I mean, anytime we get a chance to talk to 20-something librarians, it's a highlight of my week, so. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Hi, All Ariana. Right. Yeah, good to talk to you. Ariana's hey, Ariana. Fun. Yeah. Hey, John. Oh, yeah, there's some, yep. Awesome. All right, well, I'm going to stop recording now, and I guess we'll sign off, and um, see you in the fall. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.